Americans have this hole in our hearts. Kennedy was murdered a long time ago, but people still care. By 1960, the president of the United States was only 42 years old. Can you imagine? And he was going to usher in a new era of peace. He was going to avoid the Cold War. He was going to end segregation. And they blew his fucking brains out in front of everyone in Dallas. This country was never the same. People still care. That's why I made this video, and it's why you're watching it. So why did they kill him? Kennedy talked pretty about peace. No government or social system is so evil that its people must be considered as lacking in virtue. But we can still hail the Russian people for their many achievements in science and space, in economic and industrial growth, in culture, in acts of courage. For we are both devoting massive sums of money to weapons that could be better devoted to combat ignorance, poverty, and disease. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all mortal. He said he wanted to eliminate the military. We have also been talking in Geneva about our first step measures of arm control. Our primary long-range interest, however, is general and complete disarmament. And he said it more than once. The mere existence of modern weapons is a source of horror. It is therefore our intention to challenge the Soviet Union, not to an arms race, but to a peace race, to advance together, step by step, stage by stage, until general and complete disarmament has been achieved. A steady reduction in force, both nuclear and conventional, until it has abolished all armies and all weapons. Make no mistake then, they killed him for that. And every president since Kennedy has known this. But peacemakers getting killed is hardly news, eh? It's been going on for thousands of years. And the killers have put a lot of disinformation out there about who you should think murdered JFK. But there have been several breakthroughs that give us a much deeper view into the truth of who killed JFK and why. And like Hamlet said, you can't bury the truth. Like Garrison said, Power cannot possibly smash truth out of existence. And I believe that the people of America want to know the entire truth about how their president was shot down in the streets of Dallas. It's been a long slog, but we're getting there. My first two documentaries, Dark Legacy and Dark Legacy 2, are important contributions, and I need to quickly summarize the history in those videos. The most basic point is that the official story is a sick lie. I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. The same afternoon that Kennedy was shot, the New York Times reported that Kennedy had a massive gaping wound in the back of his head evidence of a shot from the front. Kennedy's press secretary described the fatal shot to reporters as coming from the right front. Dr. Berkeley told me it's a, a simple matter, Tom, of, uh, of a bullet right through the head. All of the doctors in the Dallas emergency room described the same large exit wound. This is the entrance for that huge exit wound. The official autopsy was performed by this fellow, who had never done an autopsy involving gunshot wounds, who burned his notes and then handed in a report showing this as the wound in the back of Kennedy's head. And the story gets worse and worse and darker and darker. Aubrey Reich was working in the Dallas emergency room and tells this story. I helped put President Kennedy's body in a bronze ceremonial casket on November 22, 1963, at Park Memorial Hospital. But when Kennedy's body was unloaded at the Bethesda Naval Hospital for the autopsy, it was no longer in the bronze casket. We opened the pinkish gray uh, shipping casket, and there was a gray body bag, zip, yeah. zip shut. 
We unzipped the body bag and the president's body was lifted out of the, of the body bag. Two FBI agents present at the autopsy reported seeing surgery to the head area before the autopsy started. This photo taken before the autopsy shows this surgery, and this Dallas doctor was shown the pre-autopsy photos and immediately confirmed that this surgery mentioned by the FBI and shown in this photo had not been performed in Dallas. Honestly, in looking at these photos, they're pretty much as I remember President Kennedy at the time, except for that little incision that seems to be coming down in the parietal area. He's telling us that Kennedy's head wound was altered. If Kennedy's wounds were altered between Dallas and Bethesda, that means that the president's body was somehow stolen and mutilated and then delivered to Bethesda in a pinkish-gray shipping casket while Jackie accompanied an empty bronze casket. Now, on the one hand, the monsters who had the power to do all this and then shove the official lie down our throats were so gigantic and so powerful, we can make out their shapes from a mile away. But we can also zoom in and examine the details. In 1978, Spotlight Magazine published an article citing a memo written by this man, CIA Chief of Counterintelligence James Angleton, which places this man, an admitted CIA assassin, in Dallas on the day that Kennedy was murdered. The memo says, Hunt was in Dallas the day the president was murdered and was involved in the conspiracy to kill Kennedy. Hunt sued Spotlight Magazine for slander and had his day in court. Hunt's explanation of where he was on the day that Kennedy was murdered is a disaster of impossible lies. Now, the jury found the magazine innocent of slander. The jury said publicly that they found that what the magazine had written about Hunt was true. Essentially, they found Hunt guilty of the murder of President Kennedy. Hunt has more connections to George H.W. Bush than he does to his mother. And beyond Bush's connections to Hunt, there is an absolutely dizzying array of other evidence connecting him to the assassination. The key piece is this memo signed by FBI Director Hoover five days after the assassination discussing how the FBI had been investigating the activities of CIA-controlled Cuban operatives in regard to the assassination. Hoover calls them misguided anti-Castro Cubans, Hunt and Bush were supervisors of this group of criminals called Operation Mongoose. Half a dozen of these misguided anti-Castro Cubans have admitted that they were in Dealey Plaza to witness the shooting. Another half dozen have been identified by others as being there. Hoover's memo states that Mr. George Bush of the CIA was called into FBI headquarters the day after the assassination to receive the FBI's report on these operatives. These misguided anti-Castro Cubans were obviously deeply involved in the assassination. Many have said that they worked with Bush, and this Hoover memo corroborates that fact. Bush's autobiography, in fact, says nothing at all about the Kennedy assassination. When confronted with this memo, Bush told Joseph McBride, that he couldn't be the George Bush in this memo because at the time I was in Houston, Texas, involved in the independent oil drilling business. You're going to remember those two huge and fundamental points, that he was in Houston and that his official CIA cover that day was that he was an independent oil drilling contractor. It's a secret. Dude, less than two hours after the shooting stopped, you called the FBI and you told them you were staying at the Dallas Sheraton. You put it in the papers that you were in Dallas the night before. But now, let me calm down. I hate this guy, but I don't want to overemphasize this Bush stuff. Prescott Bush, George's father, was CEO of a Nazi bank that was seized by Hoover as a Nazi asset. But let's be clear. Prescott owned one share of that Nazi operation. He was an employee. Averill Harriman owned the other 4,000 shares. Harriman was one of the major players, one of the guys at the table in charge of the conspiracy of trillionaires that murdered Kennedy. I mean, 
Watch this. Hunt and George Bush both worked together on the Bay of Pigs invasion. Their boss was Richard Bissell. And like Prescott, Bissell's boss was Averill Harriman. But it turns out, zooming in on the minor details, like who the shooters were, is interesting. Because it seems that Bush was arrested as a shooter. Hard to believe, I know. And this is where we start with another closer look at this FBI memo from the day of the assassination, written by Agent Kitchell, making an official record of a bizarre phone call Kitchell received that day, an hour and 15 minutes after the shooting of the president. The call was from one Mr. George H.W. Bush, who just thought he'd interrupt the FBI on the busiest day in their history to pass on some genuinely inane hearsay that some harmless kid had been talking of killing the president, day and source unknown. <coughs> Wait a minute. You're calling the FBI with this information about the murder of the president, and when the agent asks you when and where you heard it, you're going to say that you don't remember? How suspicious is that? The agent writing this memo is all, right, okay, now let me just get your name and address again and where you'll be tonight just in case we need to, I mean, talk to you, yeah, in case we need to talk to you later. This phone call is beyond crazy suspicious. It's crazy incriminating because it not only proves Bush was lying to McBride when Bush told McBride that he was in Houston that day, but what he did is give us proof that he was in Dallas. And it shows us that his CIA cover that day was that he was an independent oil man from Houston. Now, notice, Hoover's memo doesn't put Bush in Dallas, but with this memo, Bush put himself there. He also placed this ad in the Dallas Morning News, showing that he was speaking the night before the assassination in Dallas at the same Sheraton Hotel where he told the FBI he was staying. This ad corroborates this FBI memo in every important detail, but most importantly confirming that Bush's CIA cover at that moment was that he was an independent oil man from Houston. I suppose he placed the ad so that if a cop asked him, what the hell are you doing in Dallas? He could say, oh, I was giving a speech. You know how oil men do going around giving speeches all the time, right? Pretty bad, George, giving us all this evidence, but we're just getting started. Because Jim Garrison, the New Orleans district attorney, was, like us, looking, trying to track down the identity of the shooters. And in the process, he casually met a number of honest and competent Dallas police, and it hit him one day. Those guys were all over Dealey Plaza. They probably arrested some of the shooters. Now, the police department told Garrison they hadn't arrested anybody. And so Garrison got on the phone and started calling up the Dallas cops he had met directly, asking if they remembered arresting anyone. One of these cops he called was Roger Craig. Roger Craig was Dallas Deputy of the Year in 1960. He and Jim Garrison had become good friends, and Craig says, I told Jim I knew of 12 arrests, one in particular made by R.E. Vaughn of the Dallas Police Department. The man Vaughn arrested was coming from the Dal Tex building, across from the Texas School Book Depository. The only thing which Vaughn knew about him was that he was an independent oil operator from Houston, Texas. The prisoner was taken from Vaughn by the Dallas police detectives, and that was the last he saw or heard of the suspect. Holy moly! Please notice that in speaking to Jim Garrison, Craig says in particular, he and Garrison both thought this Dal Tex arrest was the most significant one made that day. Pretty amazing given some of the other arrests that were made. The only thing Craig knew about this particular arrestee was that he had exactly the same unique CIA cover, an independent oil operator from Houston, Texas, that George Bush was using that day in his contact with the FBI and when he placed the ad, and when he lied to McBride about being in Houston. There is not the slightest possibility that the men in charge of the assassination told anyone other than Bush, if you get arrested, tell the cops you're an independent oil operator from Houston. Not the tiniest chance. Garrison also wrote about Bush's arrest. At least one man arrested immediately after the shooting had come running out of the Daltex building and offered no explanation for his presence there. 
Local authorities could hardly avoid arresting him because of the clamor of the onlookers. He was taken to the sheriff's office, where he was held for questioning. Later, two uniformed police officers escorted him out of the building to the jeers of the waiting crowd. They put him in a police car, and he was driven away. He simply disappeared forever. Bush was running for Senate at this exact time that an angry crowd was clamoring for his arrest and jeered his release. Good grief! What if one of these people happened to see Bush's picture running for Senate and recognized him? Bush must have been terrified, no? Scared stupid, even. So stupid that the second he got out of the jailhouse, he rushed to a phone and called the FBI, hoping in a stupid panic to somehow create an alibi, but instead just incriminating himself further. So this story of his arrest makes sense. It fits together neatly with this other puzzle piece in that it helps explain that stupid phone call to the FBI. Crazy, eh? This is Colonel Fletcher Prouty. We're going to see much more of him in a few minutes. He was one of the highest-ranking CIA people at the Pentagon. One of the people he answered to was General Victor Krulak, a special assistant to JFK. Prouty and Krulak were both positive that the man in this picture is CIA General Ed Lansdale, who they both knew well and worked with on a daily basis. Lansdale was in charge of Operation Mongoose, so he directly supervised Bush and Hunt as they worked with and directed the frontline killers. In this picture, Lansdale is in Dallas, in Dealey Plaza, walking deliberately close to these suspected shooters who had been arrested behind the grassy knoll, forcing them to walk around him. He's signaling to his lieutenants that as soon as they walk in the front door of the police station, it's all arranged to quietly sneak them out the back. The pieces make a pretty tight fit. We met Hunt briefly a few minutes ago when a jury found that Spotlight Magazine was innocent of slander because the jury found that Hunt was guilty of being in Dallas and of being involved in the assassination. Turns out, though, like Bush, he wasn't just there. You see, it also turns out it's hard to hire a professional to shoot the president. A professional killer who gets away with being a professional killer isn't stupid. He knows the ropes, and briefly, he knows that if he kills the president and manages to escape the cops, the men who hired him will need to kill him. The bosses don't want to be blackmailed. They don't want truthful deathbed confessions either. And the shooter knows if he doesn't escape the cops, he's not going to make it to trial. So qualified shooters, the real professionals, refuse to take the job. That's how Bush ended up being a shooter and Hunt. This photo of Lansdale also shows three men pulled off a freight car in the rail yard immediately behind the grassy knoll. There are several photos of these men being led across Dealey Plaza to the jail. And some say that this is Hunt, but I don't see it. It's hard to know. I definitely don't think any of these photos look like Che Guevara, but guess what? That's him. The KGB made him up in this disguise. So, if Hunt is wearing a CIA disguise, this tramp shouldn't look any more like Hunt than this looks like Che. So what can we do? Renowned investigative reporter Jack Anderson hired 3M's Comtal Corporation, a firm that specializes in photographic analysis, to study this question of whether this tramp is Hunt and... Comtel agreed. Photo enhancement showed a striking resemblance to Hunt. Generally speaking, I'm mistrustful of such so-called experts. So I'm still not persuaded. So what else we got? Ears. For crime investigators, looking at photos of faces, ears are similar to fingerprints. No two are exactly the same. I'm going to copy Hunt's ear from this photo and bring it over to the tramp. The tramp photo especially is not ideal, but you can see that the ears are very similar. They both have this narrow gap right here, and they both seem to share this empty space at the top. I wouldn't convict anybody on such evidence, but if Hunt's ear looked like this or this, we'd have to say he is not this tramp. But this ear analysis says he might be. And you should know, 
Hunt's son also says that this is him. I was um, on the sidewalk. I was at a phone booth, and I was on the phone, and I looked up, uh, and on the side of the telephone pole was a very crude poster, I guess you'd call it, or a large leaflet, which announced uh, that uh, the CIA had murdered JFK, Dick Gregory, determined that, uh, that uh, E. Howard Hunt uh, murdered uh, JFK. And on this rather crude poster uh, were three photographs. Uh, and then the middle picture was a, clearly a picture of my father, E. Howard Hunt. But um, that was really crazy for me to see that. That's rather substantial. This is Hunt's son. He knows what his father looks like. He may have seen his father walking around the house with this expression on his face a thousand times. I don't know. But let's quickly revisit this magazine article about Hunt. The article was based on a memo written by James Angleton, the head of CIA counterintelligence, and he wrote that Hunt was in Dallas and was involved in the assassination. But notice, please, Lansdale was also there. Bush was also there. Other members of Lansdale's team were also there. But Angleton doesn't mention any of them, just Hunt. It's like Hunt played some special role that the others did not play, like maybe he fired the fatal shot, you think? That's a solid maybe. So how did he know? Was Hunt bragging? Nixon also seemed to know Hunt was involved and said so. That Hunt played some special role that made him stand out in Nixon's mind. Stupid Watergate Nazi G. Gordon Liddy, in his stupid book, stupidly repeats the stupid lie that Hunt killed 22 people. Hunt must have bragged to Liddy about it. You don't suppose Hunt was a braggart? Well, duh. If you write three autobiographies, count them three, you are a braggart. And in this first autobiography, Hunt includes this picture and caption. No doubt he was giving a wink to his CIA friends, bragging. Yeah, it's true what you heard. I did it. It was me. But I'll tell you, I wasn't overly impressed by all of this preliminary stuff. But with all that preliminary stuff as context, as background, I feel this picture is practically a lock that Hunt was the Knoll shooter. And it makes sense, doesn't it, that the planners would put the number one experienced sniper in the most critical position. Hunt claims that he was the chief of covert action in the Domestic Operations Division. He also claims that he was the chief of the CIA's Western Hemisphere Division. But for sure he wasn't a nobody. He had an office in Nixon's White House. So when Dick Gregory started speaking out and putting up posters saying that Hunt was this tramp and that the CIA had murdered JFK, this decoy was hired and pushed into the spotlight, James Files, to say that He was the lone grassy knoll shooter. But every witness who saw anything behind the fence at the top of the knoll says there were at least two men there. Photos show two men. He tells us that he's a murderous mafia shitbag, but he has some inexplicable devotion to the truth about how Hunt didn't do it. Okay. And he got 25 years taken off his sentence because he claimed to have murdered Kennedy. Really? Is that how that works? But... The way I see it, if this were some unknown, unimportant schmuck in this photo, no one would have thought to hire Files to tell us this lie. The fact that the killers found it necessary to hire Files, that fact is perhaps the strongest evidence that this is in fact Hunt. And then there's this clown, Chauncey Holt, who was a low-down, small-time fraudster all his life who gave his wife a phony name when he married her, and for the next 20 years, they had a daughter that he gave his phony name to, and he actually says that he's coming forward out of a righteous desire to stand up for the truth and to defend Hunt from slander. I'm not kidding. You couldn't make up more ridiculous garbage, and he says that he is the tramp in the photos. And as he's telling us this lie, he does kind of look like the tramp except that the tramp photo was taken 40 years before when Holt looked like this, 30 years younger than the tramp. This story is so dumb that the perps are bending over backwards to protect Hunt, but they don't see that by doing that, they are really only incriminating him. It's really ironic, no? Angleton's memo didn't say Hunt was a shooter, and I didn't suspect that he was. 
but after this constant pounding from all these stone liars, I'm now convinced. Hunt did that shit, but who cares? It's a minor detail, isn't it? Let's review for just a second. CIA General Lansdale in the street in Dealey Plaza was the highest ranking leader of what Hoover called the misguided anti-Castro Cubans called Operation Mongoose. Lansdale answered directly and only to Bobby Kennedy. Dealey Plaza was crowded with Lansdale's operatives. Besides his lieutenants Bush and Hunt, there were a gang of low-level operatives acting as decoys, including Frank Sturgis, Jerry Hemings, Pedro Diaz Lanz, Orlando Bosch, Guillermo Novo, and Ignacio Novo. But it's useful to look at this structure. Lansdale is the second tier down from the White House, and immediately under him was a team of lieutenants, supervisors of the violence, answerable to no one but him. Bush and Hunt were members of this third-level team, and another member of this team was Ted Shackley. Shackley was nicknamed the Blonde Ghost because he hated to be photographed. He was famous for it. But now, wait, don't all CIA people hate to be photographed? Well, no, not Hunt or Bush. And in fact, Shockley was not an operative. He was a desk jockey. He virtually never left his office. Why do you suppose it is, then, that this pencil pusher was famous for hating to be photographed? It's not a casual question. You see, this is Shackley, being arrested as a shooter outside the book depository. No wonder, then, that he was terrified of being photographed. He couldn't afford someone looking at this video and saying, Oh, shit, that guy looks exactly like Ted Shackley, which is what I said when I saw it. You can see the pattern we're developing here, no? No professional would take the job. So, to our mutual amazement, we find that the top highest leaders of the CIA mongoose operation had to directly involve themselves as shooters. Bush was arrested coming out of the Daltex building from which shots had been fired. Hunt was arrested behind a grassy knoll. And the news reporters say this Shackley twin was arrested coming out of the book depository. But we're missing somebody. Richard Carr testified that he saw a man with horn-rimmed glasses on the sixth floor. But Carr and at least four other witnesses, Amos Ewins, Tony Henderson, Arnold Rowland and Deputy Roger Craig all testified that they saw a fourth, very dark Latino member of this team of shooters. Some saw him wielding a rifle. Ewins actually saw him firing shots. Craig saw him being questioned by the police. And Carr and Craig both saw him driving the getaway Nash Rambler station wagon with Lee Harvey Oswald on board. And they all described this fourth member of the team as a very dark Latino. Wait. A very dark Latino, in the highest levels of the CIA, really? Yes, really. David Morales, who worked directly for Shackley, was Shackley's chief of operations in Miami. Miami was by far the largest operations office in the entire CIA, and Morales was in charge. This is Ruben Carbajal, Morales' lifelong friend, at his side when he died. You don't mess with him, and well, he'll blow your ass apart. And this is Bob Walton, a friend and lawyer to Carvajal and Morales. Carvajal and Walton both say that Morales told them that he was in Dallas and helped kill Kennedy. He was striding around the room, and I don't ever recall seeing him lose it like that. It was when the subject turned to Kennedy that Morales lost it. Morales told them, I was in Dallas uh, when, when, I, uh, uh, when, when we got that motherfucker. And as we're drinking it, they finally did it something. Well, well, we got the son of a bitch. That's what he said. Morales received a subpoena to testify before the Select Committee on Assassinations. A week before he was to testify, he suddenly died of a heart attack at age 53. I say, what's, what's the matter with you, Diddy? He said, well, I don't feel too good. I said, why not? I said, I had a few drinks for my cronies up there before I left uh, West D.C. He said, really? He said, in the plane, I ain't been feeling good. Wasted five hours to get him to the hospital to make them sure that he didn't, uh, I guess he wanted him dead, I guess, real good. They knocked him off, man, you know. But he knew too much. Unlike Hunt, 
Morales was not a braggart. He was not usually subject to such outbursts. I don't ever recall seeing him lose it like that. This confession, then, with all this corroborating context, is hugely credible. Morales matches the profile we now have of the shooters. He matches the descriptions, and he confessed. So, does all this qualify as a breakthrough? Bush being arrested as a shooter, that's a breakthrough, no. This guy was head of the CIA, and vice president, and president, and father of a president. He's one of the big dogs. And this is a big crime to hang around his neck, finally. And I think there's a couple of even bigger points to be scored here against the bad guys. First, we get to see that these guys, the big bosses, the power elite, are truly limited in their scope and capability. They aren't all powerful like they want us to think. Hell, they couldn't even find a team of crack marksmen to be the shooters. And they couldn't get away with it. We caught them. It took nearly 60 years, but it's not too late to hang their crimes around their necks. And to me as a historian, that feels like a breakthrough. But we've got even bigger monsters to harpoon. John Kennedy's killers wanted war because they love killing and they love war profits and they killed Kennedy for resisting. Until it has abolished all armies and all weapons. In any murder, hiding the motive is a highest priority. No matter the evidence, the killers can put on an innocent face, claim innocence, and ask, why would we want to do that? So there has been a huge, amazingly complex and effective effort by the killers to hide why Kennedy was killed by repeating the lie that he had no hard plans to get out of Vietnam. And this effort has been incredibly successful. For example, I love the movie JFK, but when I saw this scene, I was shocked. So, 1963, I spent much of September 63 working on the Kennedy plan for getting all U.S. personnel out of Vietnam by the end of 1965. His National Security Action Memo 263. I'd read a mountain of books on JFK and his murder, but I'd never read that. Did Oliver Stone, the creator of the movie, just make it up? No, he didn't. This mysterious guy in the black trench coat was real. We met him a few minutes ago. His name is Colonel Fletcher Prouty. He worked in the very highest levels of the Pentagon. In September of 1963, John Kennedy's military advisor, General Krulak, ordered Prouty to help him write up this decision to get out of Vietnam. And it was perfectly logical from the Kennedy point of view that we should not be in Vietnam. And when he wrote that we would, that all U.S., all American personnel would be out of Vietnam by the end of 65, that was Kennedy's decision. So Stone didn't make this story up. He got the story from Prouty. But did Prouty make it up? No, he didn't. All the people whose job was to know such things said Kennedy had decided to get out. Roger Hillsman said so. He was Kennedy's action officer on Vietnam. It was his job to know what Kennedy wanted and to see that he got it. And he says that Kennedy wanted to negotiate a peace with Ho and have all Americans withdraw. Kenny O'Donnell was Kennedy's chief political strategist, his number one guy. It was his job to know Kennedy's most sensitive plans. And he says that Kennedy wanted to negotiate a peace with the communists and have all Americans out by the end of 65. Robert McNamara was Kennedy's Secretary of Defense. It was his job Very to know. Very important meeting that occurred, uh, what, six weeks, seven weeks before he died, October 2nd, 1963. And what happened was that President Kennedy decided, number one, we'd plan to withdraw our advisors by the end of 1965, December 31, 65. Number two, there were 16,000 advisors there then. We'd planned to redraw the 16,000 by the end of December 1965. But I had read Hillsman. I had read McNamara. So why was I so shocked by this scene? I spent much of September 63 
working on the Kennedy plan for getting all U.S. personnel out of Vietnam by the end of 1965. This plan was one of the strongest, most important papers issued from the Kennedy White House. His National Security Action Memo 263. Because this fact that Kennedy had officially decided all personnel out by the end of 65 is not in any of their books. This Hillsman quote is from an interview with the JFK Library that he knew would be kept secret for 20 years. But it's not in his book. McNamara said this quietly once. That President Kennedy decided, number one, we'd plan to withdraw our advisors by the end of 1965, December 31, 65. At this small, out-of-the-way speech, it is not in his book. And guess what? If you look up National Security Action Memorandum 263, it's not there either. There's really almost nothing here except this note telling us to look at Section 1B of the McNamara-Taylor Report. And when we look at Section 1B, the recommendation that we find is this weak-ass, cowardly sentence about it should be possible to withdraw the bulk of U.S. personnel. McNamara says this was a decision to withdraw all 16,000 military people. But this doesn't read like a decision. It should be possible. It sounds at most like wishful thinking. Prouty and McNamara both tell us that this was a written decision, that all U.S., all American personnel would be out of Vietnam by the end of 65. And O'Donnell and Hillsman. But the official document in the official record does not say all, it says the bulk. And it doesn't say will be withdrawn, it says should be possible. So where is the language about a firm decision to remove all personnel? The answer is, it's not here. Are these guys all wrong then? All of them? Or has the most important document in the history of the Vietnam War been changed? Let's take another approach. How do you know when a decision is really a decision and not just some wishful thinking about some vague notion of withdrawal? How do you know? Because when a real decision is made, the people in the room walk out and immediately start to carry out that decision. And here you go, 40 hours after the October 2nd meeting, where President Kennedy decided to withdraw our advisors by the end of 1965. Forty hours later, General Maxwell Taylor, the head of all military, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, wrote this memo to all the military chiefs of the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines, telling them that the president approved recommendations contained in the TRIP report and the following actions are directed. All planning will be directed for the withdrawal of all U.S. personnel by the end of calendar year 1965. All personnel is exactly what Prouty said he wrote in the trip report on Kennedy's orders. Let's focus on some highlights for a minute. Taylor is telling the chiefs, this is not a discussion. You are directed to take these actions, to prepare to have all U.S. personnel out of Vietnam by the end of 1965. But my final point is that he says that these recommendations were contained in the trip report. But this is the TRIP report, and this recommendation is not here. This document, McNamara and Taylor's TRIP report, is the most important document of Kennedy's entire administration, and what we have here is a forgery. The original, we now know, looked like this. But the most important sentence was removed and replaced with this huge lie. This is huge, unparalleled, unparalleled not just in U.S. history, but in all of history, as far as I know. Name another example of a forgery of this magnitude. I can't do it. This memo from Taylor was declassified in 1997. It should have been a thunderclap among the liars who call themselves historians. It should have dominated the headlines on front pages for weeks, but you never even heard of it. No one you know has ever heard of it. No book has ever mentioned it. Exposing this document as a forgery by finding this document is a huge breakthrough. O'Donnell tells us that Kennedy decided in the spring of 1963 that the U.S. had to get out of Vietnam, but on October 2nd, he put that decision into action. He forced McNamara to put his name on the decision, and he forced Taylor to put his name on the orders. A week later, Oswald was sent to work at the book depository. So, now we know a lot about why he was killed. 
and we know a lot about who. I think it's time to ask, what did Johnson know? JFK's limousine stopped in front of the grassy knoll and sat there for over four seconds until the fatal shot was fired. Senator Yarborough was in the third car in the motorcade, 30 feet behind Kennedy when he was shot, and he said publicly that the limousine stopped. Everything slowed up. The car stopped. The motorcade did not take off till the time, till about the time the third shot was fired. A period of at least five, six, seven. And about five seconds measured this way. And he said so in his Warren Commission affidavit with undisguised fury at the Secret Service. The wife of Dallas Mayor Earl Cowbell said so in her Warren Commission testimony. Five motorcycle cops riding alongside the limousine have said so on tape. After the first shot was fired, Secret Service cut the speed on it. We were just barely moving. I would have sworn that, it, that the car stopped. Oh, three, four seconds, maybe five or six. So I'd have to say that car just all but stopped. I don't recall myself stopping. I must have but some target to it get off his motorcycle and run between those two cars. Five eyewitness news people have said so. I was on the White House press bus. I've had nightmares about it. The explosion, the car almost coming to a stop, almost to a dead stop, and then accelerating at tremendous speed. And went all of a sudden, pop, pop, pop. The limousine almost stopped for a moment and then lurched forward under the underpass. We have a phone call from Bob Clark in Dallas. We heard uh, the shots very clearly. The car that the person was traveling, this car, came to an immediate stop. The Secret Service uh, follow car. Uh, some of the agents piled out. Then almost immediately leaped back into the car, and the uh, motorcade took off very rapidly. Mrs. Kennedy screamed out, oh, no. The car stopped momentarily. The Secret Service men immediately began fanning out into the crowd. We stationed ourselves just down from the school book depository building. What I couldn't really believe was the car had, after that first shot, had come practically to a stop. Two of the closest eyewitnesses said so. The car got right beside me where I was at, and it actually stopped momentarily. And I heard Jackie Kennedy say, oh, God, no, no. And I heard John Connolly say, they're going to shoot us all. The president looked up, and just as he looked up, two shots rang out, and he grabbed his chest, and this real odd look came over his face, and he pitched forward, and there was just an instantaneous, sort of an instant's pause, and uh, in the motorcade, it momentarily halted, and three or four more shots rang out, and they sped away real quickly. Any one of these witnesses might be mistaken. Two of them might be mistaken, but all of them, all the best witnesses. But we see no stop or even slowing of the limousine in the so-called Zapruder film. How is that possible? The film was a thunderclap when it was first made public, destroying the official story that Oswald shot Kennedy from behind, obliterating it. It became the bedrock of evidence for Warren Commission critics like me, and it's a fraud. It's less like a breakthrough and more like the bottom dropping out. What the hell? In 1966, the killers handed us this proof that their own official story was a lie. Why? We need to take our time here, eh? Let's observe, first, that an unaltered version of the film would show the limousine stopping in front of the knoll and waiting for the kill shot. It would make clear that the Secret Service are not only implicated, They are thrown into the spotlight, center stage, as the stars of the show. Any one of a hundred different gunmen might have been found to fire that shot from the knoll, but only the Secret Service could have made that shot possible by first changing the route to go down Elm Street and then stopping the limousine and waiting for the kill shot. So, when I saw this official fake Zapruder film, I didn't blame the Secret Service because their crime had been removed. Instead, I blamed Lyndon Johnson and Earl Warren for lying to me, telling me the now obvious lie that Kennedy was killed by a shot from behind. And now notice, too, 
that it would have been much easier for the monsters to have changed the movement of Kennedy's body, to make it look like the shot came from behind than it was to remove the limo stop. I did this. I made this altered version of the Zapruder film, changing the movement of Kennedy's body. It took me, an amateur with a lousy copy working by myself, ten measly hours to make this change. But removing the limo stop? How do you even do that? That was a masterpiece of film editing deception. So, if it's so much easier, why did they not change the movement of Kennedy's body? Go ahead and stop the movie until you've thought about it for five or ten years. I see now, fifty years later, that I blamed Lyndon Johnson and Earl Warren for lying to me because I was supposed to blame them. That was the point of releasing this film in 1966, to make Johnson look guilty and get Nixon elected. No fooling. So let me make a couple of quick and sloppy points about Johnson. First, if we had seen this film with the limo stop, we might have excused Johnson for lying to us. We'd have understood that Johnson knew that the same men who had murdered Kennedy would murder him if he didn't cooperate. Second, notice that Johnson and Warren gave us all these documents and much more as you're about to see. Really, it's all there. Third, it means that as you watch this, your mind is being violently assaulted with a lie. Your society, all the people all around you have been psychologically and intellectually raped by this weaponized lie. But you ain't seen nothing yet, because the implications of fundamental Secret Service involvement are mind-boggling. For example... And why was this crazy, stupid public execution even necessary? This is a huge point. Given Secret Service leadership in this murder, killing Kennedy in this fashion doesn't make any sense. If you're familiar with the expression, everything that can go wrong will go wrong, it's a slight exaggeration. The absolute truth is that the more complicated your plans are, the more likely it is that big things will go wrong. And big things went wrong. The men shooting from behind were supposed to have killed Kennedy before he got to the grassy knoll. The grassy knoll gunman was supposed to then shoot Kennedy, but something went wrong, and the Secret Service had to stop Kennedy's limousine for five or six seconds. This shot in front of dozens of witnesses made it impossible to credibly blame Oswald. All the Dallas doctors insisted Kennedy had this huge exit wound in the back of his head. As we've seen, all the shooters were arrested or at least identified. That wasn't supposed to happen. After the shooting, Oswald's Italian rifle was nowhere to be found. A German Mauser was found on the sixth floor. Officer Weitzman found it and carefully identified it as a Mauser, and the news people reported this for the next three days. Mauser, German-made rifle with the sniper scope that uh, was used to kill President it's a Kennedy. 7.65 Mauser. A 7.65 Mauser. It was a 7.65 Mauser. Mauser. A Mauser. A Mauser. Oswald was supposed to have been killed during his arrest. Instead, he was brought back and put before the press where he claimed to be a patsy. People have given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. Did you shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. And on and on. The FBI reported that Kennedy's body had been mutilated before the autopsy. The initial press coverage. The car stopped momentarily. The Secret Service men. Just one disaster after the next. But an experienced commander knows that's how these things go. Shooting Kennedy in Dallas was a hugely complex operation, directly involving dozens of operatives in all of these failed operations and a dozen more. The professionals who planned this operation were experienced. They knew these things happened. That's why General Lansdale was on the scene, to fix the disasters that they knew would occur. But so, why didn't they just poison Kennedy? That would have been so easy, you have no idea. You see, John Kennedy was not a well man. He suffered painfully from stomach, colon, prostate, high fevers, dehydration, abscesses, and sleeplessness, severe back problems, and a life-threatening adrenal gland problem known as Addison's disease. He received injections of steroids, penicillin, procaine, and other painkillers, and testosterone, 
he swallowed lomatil, transitine, and nembutol, a minimum of three to five injections a day. And there was a parade of doctors through the White House administering these drugs, an allergist, an endocrinologist, a gastroenterologist, an orthopedist, a urologist, as well as Dr. Janet Travell, Admiral George Berkeley, and Dr. Max Jacobson. For our purposes, Jacobson, famously known as Dr. Feelgood, deserves the most attention. He was giving Kennedy amphetamines and God knows what else. The other doctors objected, but Kennedy famously insisted, I don't care if it's horse piss, it works. And not too surprisingly, the Secret Service had direct contact with the doctors involved in Kennedy's medical treatment, so it would have been child's play for the Secret Service to have switched out one of Jacobson's or any of these doctors, vials, from which they injected Kennedy with a concentration that would produce a lethal overdose. If they then switched back the original vial, the crime would be virtually undetectable. This operation would have taken two agents, nobody else, neat, clean, undetectable. A hundred other scenarios would have been possible when you work into the equation that the Secret Service were helping. All of these methods would be literally a billion times simpler and less risky than the shooting we witnessed. Given the opportunity offered by Dr. Jacobson's presence, it would have been a very simple matter. So why did they shoot him? I think it's very clear, isn't it? The Secret Service must have wanted Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson to witness their involvement in splattering John Kennedy's brains all over Jackie. But there was a long line of powerful men anxious to show off to the new president their involvement in murdering the old president. For example, when Kennedy's autopsy was over, Dr. Humes, the lead doctor, burned his notes and was then handed a report to sign reporting a small entrance wound in the right rear of the head where 100% of the Dallas emergency staff reported seeing a fist-sized exit wound five inches across. Quietly handing this report to Dr. Humes for his signature was all the involvement by the military that was necessary to create this false report. But Dr. Fink testified that the autopsy room was crowded with generals and admirals telling the doctors that they were in charge, ordering the doctors not to dissect the throat wound or the wound in John Kennedy's back, for example. The generals did all of this in front of the FBI agents who were present, who reported what they saw to Hoover, who reported to Johnson. So Johnson would have known everything. But again, all the generals had to do was hand this report to Dr. Humes for his signature, order him to sign it, and order him to burn his notes, and order him to shut up about it, all of which he immediately did. No other involvement was necessary. So these generals crowding into the autopsy were showing off. For no reason? Of course not. Like choosing bullets over poison, the generals made a show of taking over the autopsy for Johnson's benefit, so he could understand clearly, in the first hours after the assassination, the vast superiority of the forces arrayed against him and surrender quietly. I told you there was a line of men waiting to threaten Johnson. At 9.15, the morning after the assassination, CIA Director McCone met with Johnson to tell him that the CIA had audio tape of a phone call recorded in Mexico City at the Cuban Embassy of Oswald conversing with a Russian assassination commissar. They also had a photo of this Oswald on the scene. One imagines that McCone and Johnson would have discussed the catastrophic nuclear implications of this information. In any case, a few minutes after that meeting ended, Hoover called Johnson to inform him that he was in possession of this CIA audio tape and that it was unquestionably a fraud. It was positively not Oswald on the tape, and the photo also was certainly not of Oswald. What the hell was the CIA doing besides flaunting their involvement in the assassination? The evening of the assassination, while the presidential party was flying back to Washington from Dallas, the plane received a phone call from McGeorge Bundy, Kennedy's right-wing, pro-war, skull-and-bones national security advisor, calling from the Situation Room. 
informing everyone that the lone assassin was in custody. That was an outrageous claim. At that moment, none of the police involved thought Oswald was a lone assassin. Dallas police were announcing that there had been a conspiracy and were assuring the public that all of the perpetrators would be rounded up. John Kennedy's two closest personal advisors were on that plane, Kenny O'Donnell and Dave Powers. They had been riding in the Secret Service car directly behind Kennedy. They heard the shots from the book depository and from the front, and they told Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House. Jackie saw the limo stop. She heard the same shots O'Donnell and Powers heard. Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson were 20 feet behind O'Donnell and Powers. They also would have seen the Secret Service stop the motorcade and heard the shots from behind and from the knoll. They would have been as outraged as Senator Yarborough was about the whole affair. The car stopped. The motorcade did not take off till the time, till about the time the third shot was fired. A period of at least five, six, seven. And about five seconds. Do you think all these people kept that knowledge to themselves? Not a chance. The plane was no doubt buzzing with conspiracy theories. So all these people knew that Bundy was lying. They knew the Secret Service was involved. And for them, what they would have heard Bundy saying was, Now hear this. The new rulers have spoken. Cross us if you dare. So the next morning, by the time Johnson got off the phone with Hoover at 10.30 a.m., the line of powerful men threatening to murder Johnson if he failed to obey was a long one. And Johnson full well understood. Moments before he was sworn in on Air Force One, Kennedy's military aide, in charge of the plane, General McHugh, found Johnson in the bathroom, sitting on the toilet with the curtains closed, repeating to himself, They're going to get us all. It's a plot. It's going to get us all. Johnson was like the deputy standing over the body of the murdered sheriff. Is he going to pick up the star and put it on in front of all these killers? You'd be surprised. Lucy Johnson described meeting Senator John Kennedy at the Democratic Convention right after Kennedy had defeated her father, Lyndon Johnson, for the Democratic nomination. Uh, I went in with my father uh, while President Kennedy was dressing and did all a human being could do to look me in the eyes, to reach out and give me a hug, to make me feel like this was all going to be all right. We were going to be a team. Uh, he needed my father as I needed my father. And that the, if I would give him uh, my support and enthusiasm, that would be a gift beyond measure. And uh, I loved him for that. Uh, and my father uh, made it very clear that that's what he wanted that we were a team, and that's what I felt. Is she telling the truth about all this warmth and unity? You have no idea. The record shows that Lyndon Johnson was, bar none, President Kennedy's most important ally in his most difficult and crucial battles. JFK faced a literal army pounding him to take the decision to commit whatever United States combat forces may be necessary. 205,000 men, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, all the military staff, George Bundy at Lansdale, all put their names on a blizzard of proposals for massively committing U.S. troops to combat. Lyndon Johnson was the lone voice standing with Kennedy against these killers. In 1961, after visiting Vietnam, he wrote to Kennedy and everyone else in his report, We should make clear that we have no intention of employing combat U.S. forces in Vietnam. If the Vietnamese government cannot do this job, then we'd better remember the experience of the French. Before we take any such plunge, we'd better be sure we are prepared to become bogged down chasing irregulars and guerrillas over the rice fields and jungles of Southeast Asia. Another crucial battle in which JFK found himself alone, except for Johnson at his side, involved Bobby Kennedy's Operation Mongoose, terrorist raids, assassination plots, and invasion plans against Cuba. Johnson famously called Mongoose that damn murder incorporated down there in the Caribbean. 
He said those words in answer to a reporter asking who he thought had murdered JFK. It's a little-known and completely documented uncontroversial and sad fact that RFK ran this murder incorporated. These mongoose activities were the cause of the Cuban Missile Crisis. They were the reason Castro had requested missiles, and they were the reason Khrushchev had delivered missiles. And when JFK learned this, he ordered Bobby's office disbanded, his staff removed, and he ordered that no one planned to do anything against Cuba without JFK's explicit approval. You might well wonder at the fact that John Kennedy couldn't just ask Bobby to stop. John had to order Bundy to put a stop to it, to remove Bobby from all things Cuba, and fire his staff. This is nuts, no? The documentation is all in the footnote. And, three months later, Castro's spies told Khrushchev that Bobby's mongoose boys were getting ready to start up again, planning more attacks. And Khrushchev asked President Kennedy if we're going to have another missile crisis. Kennedy told Rusk to ask Khrushchev what he was talking about. And what's Khrushchev supposed to say to that? So he doesn't respond that we know of. But a few weeks later, after Russian ships were fired on in Cuban waters by Bobby's mongoose thugs, JFK called a meeting of all those who might possibly be involved, and he tried to act nice and cajole them into admitting that they were behind the attack so that he could make them stop. Bundy was completely in on it, but he didn't let out a peep. Secretary Rusk suggested adding one more boat to the Coast Guard. Harriman, literally the most evil bastard in a room full of evil bastards, played totally innocent and said he agreed with Rusk. McCone, the head of the CIA, said that we should say we want them to stop the raids, but not stop them. McNamara suggested that the U.S. try harder to look innocent, and Bobby, the president's loyal brother who was in charge of the raids, said we couldn't stop them because we don't know how to reach them. Even though all these mongoose thugs had been working for him for years, were still on his payroll, and he had ordered the raids. JFK then asked his vice president to tell this room full of bastards what he thought. We should stop these irresponsible people carrying out these irresponsible actions that could result in getting us involved in a war, and we should get the military after them, blow these irresponsible bastards out of the water. That is what the military does. Johnson was JFK's lone ally in this crucial situation. So... Let's return to this question of what did Johnson know. He definitely knew the Secret Service played a leading role in the assassination, and the military, and the CIA, and Bundy. He knew that Kennedy was surrounded by men who disagreed with his policy on Vietnam. But did he know that Kennedy had, 51 days before, ordered that the U.S. was getting out of Vietnam? And that he forced McNamara and Taylor to sign off on it? Given what we've just seen, it would have been more than natural for Kennedy to have confided in Johnson, and it turns out he did. Richard Goodwin was Johnson's most important speechwriter, and he describes in detail how Johnson handed him a recent top-secret McNamara report calling for escalation and told him, they're trying to get me in a war over there. I turned them down three times last week. Goodwin looked at the report and thought, that's screwy. Just six months ago, McNamara was calling for an end to the entire American commitment by the end of 1965. An end to the entire American commitment. That's from the original authentic McNamara-Taylor report, the one Kennedy made McNamara and Taylor sign and that no longer exists. Johnson not only must have had the original, unchanged version, he shared it with Goodwin which means John Kennedy had shared it with Johnson and trusted it to him. So, now, what is Johnson supposed to do? Pick up the star and get slaughtered? Four days after the assassination, Johnson signed National Security Action Memorandum 273, looking the killers in the eye, across the table, and declaring, The objectives of the United States with respect to the withdrawal of U.S. military personnel, remain as stated in the White House Statement of October 2, 1963. And any person that did not conform to policy should be removed. Damn! But the killers kept pounding. On December 21st, 
30 days after the assassination, McNamara urged that there would be a communist takeover in the next two to three months unless the U.S. acted immediately to escalate. Taylor, 60 days exactly after the assassination, told Johnson that the U.S. should start bombing North Vietnam and attack them with U.S. combat troops. But Johnson didn't budge. He said, I want to attack North Vietnam, but I can't do it without authorization from Congress. But you all go ahead and ask Congress for a resolution, but you won't like what'll happen, the hearings that they'll put on, and no one argued with him. Instead, they plotted how to push Johnson into war. Surrounded by monsters and murderers as he was, of course, Johnson had everybody's phone tapped, especially Bundy's. And... Bundy was in charge of all things Tonkin. So when Johnson was told that he needed to attend an emergency meeting about Tonkin, he came walking into the room laughing and joking because he knew this was a fraud and he thought he was holding all the cards. Finally settling down, he asked, Now what's this big emergency all about? They told him, Oh, Mr. President, there's been an unprovoked attack on a U.S. ship. Johnson knew damn well it was a lie, and he looked Cyrus Vance dead in the eye and dared him to lie to his face. Vance caved and told the truth, that the U.S. had indeed provoked the attack. Johnson then insulted General Wheeler, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and threatened to fire him if he brought him any more bullshit like this. And then he threw them all out and refused to do anything, much less begin the bombing campaign the military was demanding. You never heard that story, did you? But look it up. The meeting ended with Johnson's decision to do nothing. But there were a few cards Johnson had failed to account for. The presidential election was four months away, and Bundy ran over and told the story to Senator Barry Goldwater, the Republican nominee for president. Goldwater hollered in the headlines that there'd been an unprovoked attack on U.S. ships and that Johnson was too weak to lead the U.S., in his campaign for president, Goldwater had said he wanted to use nuclear weapons in Vietnam, and Johnson felt absolutely morally compelled to keep Goldwater out of the White House. And so when Johnson learned that a new lie was being prepared of a new unprovoked attack, he leaped into action. When the generals and admirals reported the false attack to him, he demanded that they swear, put it in writing, that it was true. And with these sworn lies in hand, he pushed the Tonkin Resolution through Congress with little discussion, no hearings, and no intention of escalating the war. You see, once he had the resolution, he still refused to act. Now his excuse was that he was just a caretaker, and he couldn't reverse Kennedy's policies and start the war until he had won an election on his own. The perpetrators had no real choice but to wait. Meanwhile... Johnson tried with all his might to paint himself into a corner from which he could never wage war. He campaigned loudly that he would never send troops to Vietnam. Bundy wasn't happy, and he said so. And sure enough, after Johnson won the election, he still refused to bomb or send troops. Now, he said, there must be a stable, effective government to conduct a successful campaign, and that he would only consider proposals for escalation after the government of Vietnam has shown itself firmly in control, which was never going to happen. Military dictatorships never inspire the support necessary to ever be firmly in control, and Johnson thought again that he had them. So now Kennedy's killers played their ace in the hole at Lansdale. Lansdale was infamous inside the U.S. government for setting off car bombs in the main square in Saigon and blaming the communists. Lodge brought him to Vietnam unofficially, and suddenly, quite coincidentally, car bombs began going off in the parking garages underneath the buildings where U.S. soldiers were staying. But Johnson refused to be sucked in. On December 30, 1964, he told Taylor directly that he wouldn't let a bunch of idiots drag him into a war, and he didn't believe their excuses for allowing these attacks. Again, damn! Brave words to be spoken to killers. Johnson was a hero? Who knew? And then came the attack on the U.S. airbase at Pleiku, the most obvious inside job of all, 
Bombs went off all over the air base, killing eight Americans, wounding over a hundred, and blowing up 18 bombers. But somehow, none of the guards saw any of the invisible attackers who suffered no casualties. Why security was so lax is the object of two investigations. The New York Times were shocked to learn that U.S. aircraft carriers were already in position to retaliate before the attack. Taylor wrote that Bundy had prepared the plan for the reprisal the day before the attack. How does that work? You remember, 35 days before, Johnson had told Taylor he wasn't buying into any of these false flag attacks. But immediately after this flagrantly false flag attack was reported, within hours in fact, Johnson caved completely. The bombing campaign began the next day and lasted eight years. Three weeks later, he sent the first combat troops, 30,000 Marines, to Vietnam. Over time, almost three million young men would have their lives poisoned by or lost to their experience of Vietnam. So what happened? How do you bring a big, genuinely tough guy to his knees? The only way I know of is that you threaten to murder his children. Acclaimed historian Robert Dalek has written three acclaimed biographies of Johnson, nearly 2,000 pages in all. While doing the mammoth research for these books at the Johnson Library in Austin, he frequently ran into his friend James Galbraith, an acclaimed professor at the nearby University of Texas. Galbraith says that on the steps of the library he found Dalek brimming with the news that he had just seen documents showing that the CIA told Johnson that Cuban communists were plotting to shoot down Johnson's plane with his family on board. Let's clarify that Dalek today has no recollection, but Galbraith was shocked when he heard it, and today he remembers the incident vividly. Now, recall please, the only reason not to have poisoned Kennedy was so that Johnson and his wife could witness the brutal, bloody murder in the street from 20 feet away. Brains and blood everywhere, so that they would understand that these men they were dealing with were monsters capable of anything. Most important, please remember that the morning after John Kennedy's murder, the head of the CIA told Johnson that they had proof that Oswald was working for the Russians and Cubans when he murdered Kennedy. Minutes later, though, Hoover told Johnson that the CIA story was bunk. The CIA blaming the Cubans, that was a lie. But JFK's murder was all too real. So Johnson, no doubt, when they told him that he better start worrying about his family being murdered, he knew that the part about the Cubans was a lie, but the threat to murder Johnson's family would have been luridly real. He could imagine the scene, his family being blown to pieces in a fiery ball. He probably couldn't stop seeing it. Why else did he betray his previous courageous dedication to John Kennedy's Vietnam policy? There isn't another credible explanation anywhere in the record. And that's why Kennedy was murdered the way he was. So that Johnson would believe the threat and give them the war that Kennedy had refused. Over the last 30 years, the top 1% of has seen a $21 trillion increase in their wealth. The bottom half of America has seen a $900 billion decline in their wealth. I said, way back at the start, that the monsters who had the power to commit such a monstrous crime were so gigantic and so powerful that we can make out their shapes from a mile away. This monster made certain that the limo stopped in front of the knoll. They arranged for the shooters to be in place. They controlled the Dallas police station and made sure that all those arrested were released and all records of their arrest were destroyed. They arranged for the body to be stolen and mutilated. They arranged for the military to take over the autopsy and ruin it. They dictated the outcome of the Warren Commission report and the content of all news coverage for the next 60 years. The single bullet theory remains intact. They planned the alteration and release of the Zapruder film and the alteration and suppression of the key government documents which would have shown Kennedy's orders to exit Vietnam, and they forced Johnson to escalate the war. So now, let's have a closer look and try to name a few of these giant monsters. Henry Cabot Lodge was a leading member of this billionaire power elite. 
a Boston aristocrat. Britannica says his family became wealthy in the 1700s, dealing opium, rum, and slaves. Nice folks, the cream of the filth. He ran against Kennedy in 1960 as Nixon's running mate. Nixon was a poor grocer's son, a mere hired stooge, and if Nixon had won, Lodge was planning to run the country on behalf of the power elite. But when he lost the election to Kennedy, he and his reptilian predator friends probably began bitterly planning Kennedy's murder the next day. Such aristocrats always have henchmen at their right hand to cover up their petty murders, paying off police officials, eliminating witnesses, whatever's necessary, often acting as chauffeurs so they can be constantly and immediately accessible. In the months before Kennedy's murder, Lodge's former driver suddenly found himself behind the wheel of Kennedy's limousine, parking it in front of the grassy knoll and waiting for the kill shot. Look it up. That was almost too easy. Mentioning Rockefellers in a discussion of the power elite is almost redundant. I mean, duh. Of course they don't say so, but the evidence shows that Lansdale belonged to them before he ever set foot in Vietnam, or Washington, or Dallas. Dulles and McCloy also belonged to the Rockefellers. This is Averill Harriman. He's the major figure in this story. Richard Bissell worked for Harriman before he went to become CIA Director of Plans. Bissell was in charge of the Bay of Pigs invasion. When he presented the plan to Kennedy, Kennedy said, Oh, hell no. You can silently sneak a few guys in in a rowboat in the dead of night, but no D-Day-style invasion is exactly what Kennedy said. But Bissell went ahead with the invasion anyway, and Kennedy fired him for it. But on whose orders did Bissell disobey Kennedy in this fashion? Of course he was taking orders from his real boss. All of the mongoose operatives who filled Dealey Plaza that day were drawn from Bissell's operation. Harriman also hired Prescott Bush and E. Howard Hunt. Prescott and Harriman were the closest of business associates. Prescott should have gone to jail for running Union Bank of New York for Harriman when the FBI seized the bank in 1942 as a Nazi bank. Bush owned one share in the bank. Harriman owned 4,000. And as we have seen, Prescott was the father of one of the shooters. George was given the job of Dealey Plaza shooter because he was an officer in Operation Mongoose, and the record shows he joined Mongoose on his father's orders. And we don't have to guess, we know who gave Prescott orders on a daily basis. We've seen the vast preponderance of evidence that tells us that Hunt was the Knoll shooter and fired the fatal shot. Hunt testified in court that after World War II, he worked directly for Harriman as his press secretary, reporting to his boss on a daily basis as they worked to rescue the Nazi perpetrators of the Holocaust from Europe. As with Bissell and Prescott Bush, there's every reason to believe that the day Kennedy was shot, Hunt was following orders that ultimately came from Harriman and his reptile friends. In 1945, immediately after Harriman's Nazi colleagues lost their war on Russia, Harriman almost single-handedly began a new war against Russia, the Cold War. Harriman was a Nazi. Harriman and his closest banking partners, Brown Brothers, began using Fritz Tyson to donate large sums to Hitler in 1923, the minute that German army intelligence had finished molding Hitler into the candidate that the monsters wanted. Harriman formally joined together with Brown Brothers in 1931, forming Brown Brothers Harriman, perhaps the largest bank in the world, but you never heard of them. The BBH website tells you proudly that they lead an industry that they say is worth $18 trillion. $18 trillion. That's a monster! Brown Brothers Harriman is in fact one of the key monsters on the planet. In 2020, the U.S. government collected total tax revenues of $4 trillion. These guys say they are four times bigger than the U.S. government. The U.S. is the richest government on the planet, and this monster makes the U.S. government look small, beyond mind-boggling. These are the guys who created and supported Hitler and the Holocaust. 
they are the military-industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. Kennedy proposed getting rid of them. A steady reduction in force, both nuclear and conventional, until it has abolished all armies and all weapons. And they killed him for it. They are the deep state that every president fears. But we can take them. Bernie, like Kennedy, proposed uniting with Russia and China to gut the military and spend the money healing the planet. We bring the world together and tell them that instead of spending a trillion and a half dollars a year on weapons of destruction designed to kill each other, maybe we pool our resources and fight our common enemy, which is climate change. This guy, Jeffrey Sachs, is a Harvard PhD, a Columbia professor, and a UN official. We should be taxing that and having a civilized world. Thank you. Wasino, an old friend of mine, once said, It is better to know where to go and not to know how than it is to know how to go and not know where. Well, I think we now know where to go, no? We have to be taxing that and having a civilized world. Thank you. With no gigantic $100 trillion monsters. We just have to figure out how to elect people to make that happen. We can do it. We can bring these monsters down. We have to do it. Whew. That was a lot to get through, eh? But get used to it. This fight is never over. I was reading this article about how withholding the JFK assassination documents is terrible for U.S. world prestige. It makes us look like a banana republic that can't even be bothered with the trappings of law and order, and it got me thinking. Who is it inside the walls of the U.S. government who not only doesn't give a damn about U.S. prestige, but who has the power to make the president also not give a damn? And notice... The JFK assassination was infinitely worse for American prestige. Aren't these guys American? Isn't their power and prestige linked to America's power and prestige? Or were they just taking orders? You will kill JFK. From some closeted power too huge to imagine. Now go. What unimaginably huge power structure is it with operatives inside the halls of the U.S. government that not only doesn't give a damn about U.S. prestige, but has the power to make every president since Kennedy complicit in the cover-up? That's right. <laughs> you can note, if you like, that U.S. unconditional support of Israel, regardless of the worst atrocities, is similarly terrible for U.S. prestige. And why do we do it? It's as if some hidden invisible power were pushing every administration since Truman to support the insufferable. This Rand Corporation document suggests that the U.S. should weaken Russia by forcing them to waste money on a defense budget. But wait. Isn't wasting money on a defense budget applicable to the U.S. as well as to Russia? Taking food from hungry Americans, saddling college students with billions in debt, many of them homeless, instead of scholarships? Why doesn't the military-industrial complex care about Americans and U.S. economic well-being? Maybe because they're not Americans? That's right. <laughs> Harriman was working for Brown Brothers and they are not American. In 1790, the Brown brothers landed in Philadelphia, fat with profits from the British slave trade. By 1837, they were worth 1.2 million pounds, a huge amount in 1837, representing as much as 20% of the entire wealth of the United States. The Rothschilds took over Brown brothers that year. But that was nothing. The Rothschilds had taken over the Bank of England 12 years before. Just took over the bank. They owned the goddamn king in 1837. 
The Rothschilds and their friends owned every stone, stick, and slave in the United States, though this was done very quietly. They owned Alexander Hamilton. They owned all the banks, shown here eating President Andrew Jackson alive. They bragged that we take a lion's share in the profits from American slavery. They owned the railroads, which means they owned the Harrimans. They founded Israel, they are the military-industrial complex, and they killed JFK. Just look it up on Wikipedia, it's all there. You remember James Angleton. He was in charge of catching bad guys inside the CIA. All the facts we know suggest powerfully that when Oswald came back from Russia, he worked for Angleton. The dots all line up. And when the killers tried to use this fact that Angleton had a file with Oswald's name on it to implicate Angleton in the assassination, in self-defense, Angleton wrote that memo naming Hunt as a main character in the assassination. Uncovering that story is scratching way below the surface, but there's much more. Angleton gave the memo to Joseph Trento, who published it, Trento had another source besides Angleton deep in the CIA, William Corson, who was also JFK's most trusted man inside the CIA. He had been a top, top, top secret operative under Eisenhower, but he was loyal to Kennedy, and he spied on the CIA for Kennedy. Corson knew people inside who trusted him and who would tell him stuff. And now look at this from Trento's book. Corson told Kennedy that Harriman ignored Kennedy's orders and did whatever he wanted, killing DM, for example. He ran McGeorge Bundy, and Angleton told Trento that Harriman was a Soviet agent, or maybe much worse. Maybe much worse? What the hell could that possibly mean? I think it means he was an agent of these British fascists, British Nazis, if you will. You will have noticed footnotes throughout the movie, down at the bottom. I put these in when I felt the point needs more explanation or documentation, and that more explanation is what follows. Bush and Hunt were supervisors at the Bay of Pigs and later of Mongoose. Prouty worked for the CIA inside the Pentagon. He supplied the ships and weapons for the entire Bay of Pigs operation. The code name was Operation Zapata, and Prouty tells us that name for that operation came from the name of Bush's oil company, Zapata Offshore. And Prouty says Bush named one of the ships at the Bay of Pigs after his wife, the Barbara. Now, you have to be able to add one plus one to figure this out. Prouty was the guy in charge of acquiring these ships and putting the names on them. If one of these ships got named after Bush's wife, it's because Bush told Prouty to do it. But Prouty can't say that because it's a secret. But he did give us the pieces so we could add them up. Bush was a high-ranking leader of the Bay of Pigs invasion and of Operation Mongoose. A friend expressed doubts to me about whether Prouty or anyone could look at this picture and be sure that it was Lansdale. And that's very reasonable but there are a number of points. The first is that Prouty is absolutely credible. At 32 minutes and 48 seconds in this video, Prouty goes way out on a limb, saying that he personally had written into McNamara's trip report that all U.S. personnel should be out of Vietnam by the end of 65, a very precise specification that is completely corroborated by the Taylor memo. He was the real Mr. X from the movie JFK, who contacted Garrison and told him about Kennedy's orders to completely end U.S. involvement. He's written a couple of books, both excellent, and he worked in the highest levels of the Pentagon. He worked directly with Lansdale, among others, on a nearly daily basis. Prouty says he intervened with Dulles and General LeMay to get Lansdale a promotion to general. However, I don't think that Prouty would have spotted Lansdale in this picture if he wasn't looking for Lansdale. So he was looking for him, he suspected him, and then he spotted him, and he wrote to one of the other generals that he answered to, General Krulak, Kennedy's top military advisor, who also knew Lansdale very well, and look at the response. Apparently, Lansdale 
was very distinctive in appearance. A distinctive haircut, a distinctive stoop, a distinctive twist to his left hand, and a distinctive huge class ring. What is beyond doubt is that Prouty would not have said it if he didn't know that it was true. I suspect Krulak of being similarly scrupulously honest. Nice to learn that there are such people. Marita Lorenz was a well-known member of Mongoose. In the Spotlight Magazine slander trial, she named these men as being present with her in Dallas to act as decoys during the assassination. The transcript of her testimony is here. Now, I'm open to the suggestion that this might not be Shackley. The official story is that his name is Larry Florer, but without question, he looks exactly like Ted Shackley. And he was in Dealey Plaza for no reason. And he went into the Dal Tex building for no reason, to the third floor from which shots had been fired for no reason. And then he made such a nuisance of himself so as to attract attention and got himself arrested. Really? That's all a coincidence? That's a hell of a coincidence. But so... Even if this is not Shackley in this video, the presence of this Shackley double is still important evidence that Shackley was there and that this guy was sent to cover for Shackley, who was probably also arrested. You see, this is part of a pattern. It's complicated, so stay on your toes. Bush was arrested coming out of the Dal Tex building by Roy Vaughn, a capable cop who later made detective and eventually chief of Midlovian, Texas. You don't make detective by being careless or stupid. This was the most important arrest of his career. So we can rely on his account that the man he arrested told him that he was an independent oil contractor from Houston. But you see, a short time later, this guy, like the Shackley lookalike, made a point of getting himself arrested in the Dal Tex building. Like Shackley's double, he walked around acting suspiciously until a security guard arrested him and he identified himself to police as an independent oil contractor from Beverly Hills. Garrison felt certain that this guy was a plant, an operative, sent by the killers to distract us from the real arrest that took place that day. He also had a long list of phony names. In fact, supposedly responsible investigators have told me, Oh, that wasn't Bush that was arrested. That was Braden, or, or Brading or whatever name he was using that day, but come on, a detective is not going to confuse Beverly Hills with Houston. That just is not going to happen. And this guy, standing in the street, across from the grassy knoll that day, is wearing an E. Howard Hunt Halloween costume, which is a trench coat, sunglasses, and this hat. So these guys all had lookalikes on the scene. And if this guy isn't Shackley, he's an extraordinarily perfect double, chosen because he looks just like Shackley. And he was clearly, just like Bush's double, sent to get arrested. The fact that this astonishing Shackley lookalike was there, on the third floor of the Dal Tex building, for no reason other than to get himself arrested, implicates Shackley. But if Shackley wasn't also a mongoose team member with Hunt and Bush and Morales, this arrest would not be worth mentioning. Another friend of mine, also a really good guy, points to this book and tells me McNamara did say Kennedy decided to get out. But I disagree very much. Here, McNamara gives us this weak tea BS we saw earlier in the video about it should be possible. But here he says this was his recommendation, not a decision by Kennedy. Here he says, There was a heated debate about our recommendation that the Defense Department announce plans to withdraw military forces by the end of 65. But first, he didn't recommend in his report that anybody announce anything. And more importantly, there's nothing about Kennedy deciding that the U.S. should get everybody out by the end of 65. Here he says, Kennedy endorsed withdrawing a thousand men. And that's not saying that Kennedy decided to withdraw everybody. You can read the rest on your own if you want to. It's just not there. So this is the one time he said it. He deliberately and effectively hid this crucial fact about Kennedy deciding to get out 
and he hid it from you, and he hid it from me, and from all of history. This needs to be an hour long. Some of it is well known, some of it is not. When Oswald was in high school in New Orleans, he joined a club, a junior Civil Air Patrol, where you get to look at planes and meet gay pilots. The program was run by the notorious David Ferry, who worked for the CIA's chief gunrunner in New Orleans, Guy Bannister, formerly head of the FBI's Chicago office. Ferry introduced Oswald to Bannister and got him a job as a messenger for one of Bannister's dirty gun-running, money-laundering associates. When Oswald joined the Marines, Bannister likely recommended him for a security clearance. In any case, Oswald was sent to a beyond-top-secret U-2 spy plane base in Atsugi, Japan, where he somehow mysteriously became fluent in Russian. He was then given a hardship discharge to care for his mother, who wasn't sick, and instead of caring for his mother, with money he didn't have, he traveled to Russia and announced that he was defecting, and that he was going to tell the Russians all the secrets he knew about how to shoot down a U-2. Now, Eisenhower was trying to ease Cold War tensions, and stop wasting all that money on weapons, and the bankers couldn't let that happen, so they plotted to expose the fact that that the beyond-top-secret U-2 spy plane had been secretly and illegally flying over Russia spying on them. Prouty says they sabotaged the plane, but they had to explain to Eisenhower how it is that the plane came down, and they pointed to Oswald, who worked at the U-2 base. Oswald wasn't a spy. He was a completely expendable stooge. And when Oswald finally figured that out, he came back to the U.S., and he was apparently immediately acquired by Angleton on his return to spy on Russian defectors in Dallas. Angleton suspected all these people of being fake defectors, of being actual spies, and he had CIA operative George de Morenschild take Oswald around and introduce him to all these suspicious Russians. And the FBI also recruited Oswald. It's all there in the Warren Commission documents the testimony of the FBI agents who recruited Oswald as an informant. The testimony shows that Oswald was supposed to report any contact he had with any Russian spies who wanted to recruit him. Presumably, he was collecting two paychecks, one from the CIA and one from the FBI. And that's why, 60 years later, you can't see his W-2 forms. Letting you see them would threaten national security of the United States, don't you know? No? So... When Khrushchev told Kennedy that Mongoose was still in operation, Kennedy called in Hoover and told him to make them stop. Hoover knew his old friend Guy Bannister was involved, and he knew that Oswald had been involved with Bannister. So Hoover called Bannister and asked him to take Oswald under his wing and help him pretend to be a communist. Hoover told Bannister he wanted Oswald to infiltrate the communists in the Fair Play for Cuba Committee but Oswald was actually there to locate Bannister's secret base that was supplying Mongoose with training and weapons. Oswald located the base, the FBI shut it down, and JFK's killers then decided to set Oswald up as the communist killer for Kennedy's murder. Oswald was eventually sent to Dallas to work with Jack Ruby, pretending to be terrorist assassins, so that the Secret Service could practice catching terrorist assassins. The guys who pretend to be bad guys so that the good guys can practice catching them are called the B-Team. That's what Oswald was doing in Dallas, with Ruby, when real killers started showing up, Sturgis and Hemmings and all those guys. Oswald told Hoover, and Hoover put out a memo warning of the coming assassination in Dallas, and someone somehow convinced JFK to ignore Hoover's warning. Oswald had infiltrated the killers up to the last minute, and then they killed him, and now you know everything. Really, the documentation is already in the video, but here are the raw documents. If you Google a few words, it should bring them up on the government website. But if you're like me, we have been brought up to regard Bobby as a hero, and by themselves, I could not accept these documents as credible so I thought it was worth taking some time to go into some real depth. Twenty years ago, a friend, David Korn, told me to read this piece of garbage, which says that John Kennedy was killed by the Cubans in retaliation for Kennedy trying to murder Castro. 
I figured it was all lies, and it cites these documents, but I figured that the documents must be fake. But then I ran into Bobby's interview with the JFK Library. We've seen one of these library interviews already. These interviews were supposed to be kept secret for 20 years so that people could feel free to tell the truth. And here, Bobby brags about being part of Mongoose. He says, we. Here he brags that he was involved all the time. And here he brags about recruiting Lansdale, who was famous inside the State Department for blowing up civilians in Saigon. While working for Bobby, Lansdale wrote Operation Northwoods, and here Bobby calls Mongoose we again. These are words from Bobby's own mouth, from the Kennedy Library, so these documents are, sadly, completely credible. This is just incredible drama. Johnson's sharing of this document with Goodwin shows clearly that Kennedy had shared his decision to get out of Vietnam with Johnson. As I mentioned in footnote number 7, Hoover had written a memo warning of the assassination. William Walters, the FBI clerk, who reported the existence of this now-disappeared memo, is a very stable, competent guy. You can see from this entire video, Johnson and Hoover trusted and relied on each other. So it seems very likely that Johnson knew about Hoover's warning, and that Kennedy and Johnson would have discussed what Johnson should do in the event of Kennedy's murder. How could they not have? And as we've seen... Johnson's survival mode tactic was to stall, to pretend to go along, and then wait for whoever was running the Vietnamese government that week to tell them to get out. Harriman and Lodge murdered Diem because he was negotiating with Ho to throw us out. Then they overthrew Big Min because he was negotiating with Ho to throw us out. Then they overthrew Khan because he was negotiating with Ho to throw us out. There's a recorded conversation between Senator Russell and Johnson where they both said that they were hoping for and waiting for the government in Vietnam to throw us out. But the bad guys managed to stay one step ahead and finally found General Key, just an incredible low-life scum, who said in so many words, if the U.S. wants to fight this war, fine, we'll let them. This version of events comes from Thomas Hughes, the head of the State Department's Intelligence Division, the INR. He was there, and he told this story at a meeting of historians in Georgia. You can find it quoted extensively in this book. One of the most amazing things I've ever seen in print. I consider Hughes completely reliable. But the irrefutable fact is that they told Johnson there was an attack, and he did nothing in response completely corroborating Hughes' version of events. This is worthy of a much more extensive treatment, a video of its own, but quickly, meet Graham Greene. He was a British spy during World War II, and after the war he continued to spy, of course, now posing as a reporter for the Times of London, stationed in Vietnam, and he discovered that Lansdale had blown up two cars in the marketplace in Saigon, killing dozens of innocent civilians and blaming it on the communists. And Green wrote this book exposing it all, which is now this absolutely fabulous movie. The head of the UN discussed this book with the U.S. Secretary of State, and when the Rockefellers were pushing for Lansdale to be ambassador to Vietnam, Graham Parsons pointed out that the entire world knew that Lansdale was a CIA war criminal, and Lansdale got passed over and Bobby picked him up to head Mongoose. Why security was so lax is the object of two investigations. It's hard to imagine how this could have been more obviously a false flag. It seems that the attack was not a surprise. The U.S. forces were expecting it. Yet the attackers were able to completely penetrate the air base right up to the barracks where the soldiers were sleeping. This should have been a suicide mission because of all the defenses in place and the vast expanse of the airfield that had to be crossed by the attackers in order to place these bombs. But somehow, miraculously, the attackers were invisible, and not a single attacker was killed, injured, or even seen.
Before Vietnam, Lansdale was famous for his terrorist work in the Philippines. Bobby says that's why he chose Lansdale. But why was the U.S., the CIA, and Lansdale supporting some Magsaysay guy that no one ever heard of? Apparently, because the Rockefellers loved him. I don't know why, but this document shows that they did, and it shows that when Lansdale was being paid by the CIA to promote Magsaysay, using terrorism, he was working for the Rockefellers. As usual, this segment should be 40 minutes long, but we don't have that kind of time right now. We have three documents showing that Kennedy gave this order of no D-Day style invasion. It's no wonder then that he fired the three top men at CIA, Dulles, Bissell, and Cobble, because they launched the spectacular Dawn invasion against Kennedy's explicit orders. But you won't find any of this in the mainstream historical account. You won't find any historian talking about it. And why is that? Maybe because the men behind this event were the men who killed Kennedy? But there's much more going on here that we need to account for. These documents are on the U.S. government website. But what we're going to look at now is not. Five minutes after the Bay of Pigs was over, Kennedy called General Maxwell Taylor out of retirement, gave him a star so that he was the highest ranking officer in the military, and told him to find out how the hell this happened. Taylor called in all the participants. Bobby Kennedy was also there, as we'll see, cross-examining these criminals. This is the original publication of the official report. It's not available online or anywhere else, and it will help us look at some other issues. First, why did these bastards go ahead with the invasion? They had to know they would all be fired for disobeying such a clear and direct order. What were they thinking? What did they want that they thought they could get by getting themselves fired? It's a big question, so let's look at some stuff that might help us figure it out. This invasion never had the tiniest chance. This was a suicide mission that these bastards sent other people to die for, but for them it was professional suicide, and for what? Bobby Kennedy let Dulles have it over the fact that the invasion had zero chance. Here, Bobby hammers Dulles into silence, and then he turns on Admiral Burke to hammer him for his approving this incredibly stupid invasion plan. And after making these guys admit that they all knew the plan couldn't possibly work, Bobby demanded to know why it wasn't called off. But let's come back to that in a minute. You remember how, before today, you never heard of Kennedy saying no D-Day style invasion. Well, you never heard any of this either. After Castro's revolution in 1958, many of the fascists who loved the corrupt and brutal dictatorship that Castro had overthrown left Cuba and came to the U.S. Eisenhower didn't know exactly what to do with this criminal element, who wanted the U.S. to help them destroy Castro, so they sent them to Guatemala for guerrilla training, with the idea that they could sneak back into Cuba if they wanted and conduct guerrilla warfare against Castro. Sending these criminals to Guatemala at least shut them up, kept them busy, and got them off the streets of Miami. But in January, just before Kennedy's inauguration, this concept of guerrilla infiltrators became shifted to the concept of a much stronger invasionary strike force. Now hold on a minute. Castro came to power in 1958, and Eisenhower started training a few hundred men to quietly infiltrate Cuba as guerrillas, and two years later, in November of 1960, Kennedy won the election. And as of election night, U.S. policy toward Cuba was no longer really any of Eisenhower's concern. But two months after it was no longer any of their business, criminals closeted inside the Eisenhower administration began changing the minimal policy of training a few guerrillas for a quiet infiltration to a policy of developing a strong strike force for an invasion. That's nuts. It's criminal, in fact. It was a coup against Kennedy before he took office to steal his power as U.S. president to set Cuba policy and to push him headlong into a violent plan for a violent invasion that neither Kennedy nor Eisenhower wanted or had approved. Like I said, this was criminal. Kennedy knew it was criminal, and that's why he called Taylor out of retirement, 
to investigate this crime, and it's why he fired the top three stooges at the head of the CIA. But so now, let's come back to this question. What did these three guys gain by throwing their careers away? The one thing they succeeded in doing was ruining Kennedy and Castro's plans for peace. Both men felt Kennedy's election was an opportunity for them to normalize relations between the two countries. Kennedy especially felt that if he could show that America could live in peace with communists in Cuba, that that would completely undercut those who wanted war to fight the communists in Vietnam. A longer video would document that fairly obvious point. There's a lot to notice about this letter. Virtually any source, including Wikipedia, will tell you that Neil Mallon was George Bush's employer, and he's writing to Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, to set up a meeting with Prescott Bush to discuss their pilot project in the Caribbean. George Bush was their pilot project in the Caribbean. George Bush set up his Caribbean oil company, Zapata Offshore, right in the middle of CIA operations in 1953. Hunt worked directly for Harriman as his press secretary. I think we've pretty well established Harriman's Nazi connections. If you read Hunt's autobiography, you will find he is a fascist. Google Operation Paperclip. The CIA was rescuing Nazis from Europe at this time. Ask yourself why. They rescued rocket scientists and secret police and Eichmann and Goering and the top leaders of the Holocaust and Nazi Germany. This is part of a short video I made last month on the Cold War. Before sending England any war aid, Roosevelt forced Churchill to sign the Atlantic Charter, agreeing that all people have the right to choose the form of government under which they will live. In other words, Roosevelt forced Churchill to agree that England had to give up its colonies. Looking at the previously secret Yalta agreements, Eric Alterman has exposed the lie that we have always been told about Russian aggression in Eastern Europe. At the end of the war, Roosevelt and Stalin both had to decide how to prevent the losers, the fascist countries, from returning to fascism. And it was agreed that the U.S. would take responsibility for France, Italy, Western Germany and Greece, and Russia, which had lost 26 million people fighting these fascists, Russia would make sure that it had friendly anti-fascist governments in place in the country along its own borders. There was no Russian seizure of Eastern Europe. It was agreed, and there is not and has never been any evidence that the Russians ever had any intention of expanding westward. But Averill Harriman, rushed from Russia to the United States the instant Roosevelt died and began filling Truman's head with the lie that the Russians had seized Eastern Europe and wanted to invade Western Europe. Alterman says Harriman was acting like he knew Roosevelt was about to die. How did he know? But now meet Archimedes Patty, the head of U.S. military intelligence for Vietnam. We had instructions from the White House, from President Roosevelt, through General Donovan, uh, not to assist the French in returning and recouping their former colony. Roosevelt not only forbade anyone from giving arms or help to the French, Roosevelt made clear that he felt that the French needed to be thrown out. Donovan, the head of the OSS, told Patty to go ahead and use Ho Chi Minh, meaning to give him and his men weapons and training, which Patty did. Under Roosevelt, the U.S. armed and trained Ho's army. But did you miss that? The U.S. was already using Mao before they started using Ho. Under Roosevelt, the U.S. was giving arms and training to Chairman Mao and his troops. Weapons and training that Roosevelt knew would be used to put the communists in power in China and in Vietnam as Patty knew that the arms and training the U.S. was giving Ho would be used against the French. In Roosevelt's eyes and in Patty's eyes and probably Donovan's, 
The communists were the good guys. Kind of a duh. Patrice Lumumba, Kennedy, Kennedy, Malcolm, Martin, Medgar, Fred Hampton, Mark Clark, Fidel, Che, and Kennedy. At several cocktail parties, Nancy Pelosi has said that Cheney killed Wellstone. And don't you doubt it. That's why no Democrat can talk about the deep state or 9-11 or even JFK 58 years after the fact. So, surprise, surprise, Roosevelt's son, Elliot, says Stalin told him that his dad, FDR, was murdered by the Churchill gang. Wait, you remember that part? Averill Harriman rushed from Russia to the United States the instant Roosevelt died and began filling Truman's head with the lie that the Russians had seized Eastern Europe and wanted to invade Western Europe. Alterman says Harriman was acting like he knew Roosevelt was about to die. How did he know? Harriman knew because the American fascists killed FDR. Elliot tried to get that story published in 1946 and couldn't, so he waited 40 years and tried again. Roosevelt died, Truman was lied to by the American fascists and told that the Russians were monstrous aggressors. Eisenhower let the fascists run wild, but then Kennedy came in. I don't think there can be any question but that Kennedy was murdered because he planned to end the Cold War. And Johnson, and every president since, has lived knowing that, and lived explicitly with the same threat, that is, knowing that they would be murdered if they tried to change the way things are. So, I say, defund the military and spend that budget helping people and the planet. This is all now on the public record, though I guess they might erase it. First, let me clarify above all that the Holocaust is real, and all the horrors described are at least as bad as presented. Second, I don't believe that those responsible for the Holocaust have ever been identified. For example, the Rockefellers seized the assets of their Jewish depositors and then ordered Hitler to order them to do so. Google, I was Hitler's boss. The author, Captain Mayer, says that Hitler was an idiot, essentially, who was trained by Mayer as an infiltrator of German worker organizations and sent to join the German Workers' Party by the Supreme Commander Ludendorff. And completely a puppet and that Hitler did whatever he was told, including rail against Jews, though he had been friendly towards Jewish people before his encounter with Captain Mayer and German Army Intelligence, for whom he was an agent. Mayer says that Ludendorff planned Hitler's rise with capitalists and others at the Four Seasons Hotel in Munich, from which the Holocaust was later directed. Auschwitz was a 100% subsidiary of I.G. Farben, ostensibly owned by the Rockefellers, but fundamentally tied to the Rothschilds. The I.G. Farben house was built on land presumably acquired from the Rothschilds. The land belonged to the Rothschilds beforehand. We've seen the connection between Averill Harriman and Tyson and Hitler and the Brown Brothers Bank, which had been acquired by the Rothschilds in 1837. The Wannsee Conference was a meeting of the German High Command to plan the Holocaust. The orders to develop the plans for the death camps and the ovens came out of this meeting. The meeting took place on January 20, 1942. By that date, the Germans were losing badly on the Russian front, in full retreat. The U.S. was now at war with Germany. Before Pearl Harbor, the writing had been on the wall for some time that the Germans were going to lose. Now it was in giant flashing red neon. On this date, German soldiers were freezing, dying by the tens of thousands on the Russian front, and the German high command decided to divert critical resources, trains, and soldiers to murder harmless Jewish people, many of whom were working in defense plants. How does that make any sense? From whose point of view was that a good idea? In whose interest would it have been? One group. If the Nazis could succeed in wiping out entire families, there would be no survivors to claim the bank accounts and life insurance deposits held by the bankers. 
a fortune estimated at a trillion nineteen forty two dollars. I wish I was making this up. I thought you should hear a longer portion of this clip. The private sector is not going to solve this problem. Now, I have it on good authority. You don't need more than a billion dollars to be comfortable. But they have an excess of $11 trillion, so we should be taxing that and having a civilized world. Thank you. Wasino is from the movie Burn. Burn is a fabulous movie starring Marlon Brando. Today you can see it on Amazon Prime and Apple TV. Do yourself a favor and watch it. For the social scientists out there, I thought I'd take a minute to address the question of how the hell we got to be where we are, living in a world dominated by these monstrous reptiles. Has it always been like this? Is it human nature to have wars and poverty and giant monsters dominating society? No. In fact, paleoanthropology shows that such behavior is the opposite of human nature, to the point that these lizards could be properly characterized as subhuman. 30 million years ago, the global weather at the time fostered a world that was covered with forests, and those forests were filled with monkeys, all kinds of monkeys and apes, massive ones like gorillas, less massive ones like chimps, but our ancestors were the only ones who could survive outside the rainforest because our ancestors shared. Richard Leakey and a host of other paleoanthropologists have devoted their lives to proving this point. Owen Lovejoy, my favorite, points to the fact that we and our ancestors have a lot more sex than all the other apes. It's one of the main differences, and Lovejoy argues that this is probably why our species shares. Regular sex fostered, selected for, permanent relationships, love and sharing were selected for, and as a result of the parents sharing with each other, the kids survived, and our species survived in areas where no other ape could survive. Upright walking on two legs evolved and was selected for because and only because it freed our hands to carry more food home to our loved ones. Without question, the sharing of food has always been fundamental to all human societies for the last 20 million years at least. Our very complex, interdependent communities led to a much higher survival rate for the children and fostered the development of language and fostered the development of human emotional responses like sympathy and love all of which fostered the vastly successful sharing behaviors which allowed our ancestors to thrive in hostile environments where no other ape could hope to survive, much less thrive, for millions and millions and millions of years. Tribes were the principal social organization and endure today. Our ancestors eventually stumbled upon the domestication of fire, which allowed them to move out of Africa. And then they stumbled upon agriculture, which led them to develop villages, settled communities, but with sharing and cooperation and love at the very center of everything, of all human activities. 10,000 years ago, there were cities of 10,000 people with no palaces or mansions. Everyone shared, no rich and no poor. And then something happened. Climate change, probably. If you're a hunter-gatherer living on a relatively uninhabited planet and the climate changes, you can go wherever you need to go to survive. But if you have a city of 10,000 people and then suddenly it doesn't rain for 20 years, it's a very, very serious problem. And this may have caused the disaster that led to the breakdown of the communal tribal principle of sharing of the whole community committed to the good of all that had guided our species through 20 million years. Something, some unknown cancer, led to the development of societies ruled by stingy, murderous monsters who preyed on innocent communities, predator societies like the Athenians and the Israelites. Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad all reacted to this horrible change. They reacted to this move toward brutal selfishness by leading their followers to treat each other like family. Hell, the Founding Fathers found themselves pretending to be communists, saying we should all work together for the benefit of all. They certainly were not promoting government of the rich, by the rich, for the rich. 
My point is that these ideas that governments should serve the interests of everybody in society, especially those most in need, the idea that all members of society should look out for all members of society, these are ancient communist ideas. They are also absolutely basic to what it means to be a human, and the anti-communism of the Cold War is anti-human, reptilian even, as well as fascist. Government of the people, by the people, for the people, on the other hand, is a communist notion. On the off chance that some of you don't know the truth, I can't let you go without clarifying some points about the attacks of September 11th. When it comes to the issue of 9-11 truth, Alex Jones is a straw man and an easy clownish target. You won't find John Oliver making fun of these guys, however. Stephen Jones and David Ray Griffin are two of the real leaders of the 9-11 Truth Movement. Griffin and Jones are world-class scholars, preeminent in their fields. Jones was a conservative Republican Mormon who voted for Bush and a tenured physics professor with a world-class reputation in the development of XEDS, a process measuring the energy level of an electron in order to identify what kind of atom it came from. One of his physics students asked him about the collapse of Building 7, which was not hit by a plane and which collapsed on the afternoon of September 11th in a pattern precisely resembling a controlled demolition. Jones discovered that the official explanation was completely anti-scientific, and he began speaking out, based on simple physics, jet fuel can't melt steel beam sort of thing. But then he woke up one morning and remembered that his specialty was in XEDS, he obtained samples of dust from 9-11, and the first thing he discovered was microspheres of iron. Microspheres are only created by melting. The 9-11 dust was full of proof that the steel had been melted. But his prize was this slide, one side of which is a spectrographic analysis of one of these iron microspheres, and another is a spectrographic analysis of thermite, the steel-cutting explosive used for controlled demolitions around the world. The dust from the World Trade Center is full of proof that explosives were used. The dust is also full of pieces of unexploded thermite, the remains of the wrappers that contained the explosives. Professor Jones has hugely contributed to the science of 9-11 truth. David Ray Griffin is a tenured professor of philosophy and theology at the prestigious Claremont McKenna College. He's a very highly regarded professional scholar. His life's work involves examining arguments and evidence to see whether the evidence supports those arguments. He has devoted himself to examining the official statements and the evidence, and for the last 15 years he has been explaining in professional scholarly detail that the evidence does not support the conclusions in the official government statements, but in fact, the simple observable facts show that the 9-11 attacks had to have been carried out in close cooperation with the highest ranking elements of the U.S. government. In a CNN poll, with 10,000 people voting, 89% said that there was a government cover-up regarding the 9-11 attacks. Well, that's not scientific, but in a 2007 scientific poll conducted by Scripps Howard and Ohio University, 62% found it likely that the federal government knew in advance and let the attacks happen. Because of this disconnect between the widely observable truth and the lies politicians tell in public, Cambridge Analytica determined that yelling deep state and fake news and conspiracy was an effective means for winning support from this huge percentage of voters.